Two thousand years ago, the Divines ended a journey they had individually set upon lifetimes before. They converged in front of an elderly man named Esther. They had spent years honing their magic, building their strength, searching for the perfect pawn in a plan that they themselves did not yet fully understand. This man became the first king of Esera, the peacemonger Esther, the man who would unite twenty warring clans in a matter of forty-five days before succumbing to blood poisoning at the feet of the divines who had searched so long for him. They honored him with his title before they set off to find the first queen, whose destiny would come to pass as she designed the infrastructure to the empire that still dictates your very lives today. Nolaith, the architect, devised the three branches of government, the peacekeepers, who would serve as your constables, militia, and guards, the college, whose sole purpose was to educate the populace who were deemed worthy at annual trials, in hopes that fostering the best in people would further Esra's greatness. Finally, the blind court, where those who are found to act against the empire or any of its citizens are brought before the wisest minds and judged. She gave dominion over each branch to the divine whose interest most aligned with that position. She was the only monarch to give the divines names as well. The hand, the sight, and the breath of Esra would step into the roles they had been born to perform. For two thousand years, this cycle repeated. The divines would find the person most fit to rule whose powers would enthrall the empire time and time again. Some lived longer than any member of their race should have, Others held the title mere days, but the Divines were the only deathless ones. Whether it was disease, the hand of a forsaken comrade, in defense of the Empire, or peacefully of old age, the Monarchs would fall, and the Divines would set out to find a suitable replacement. It became common knowledge in Esra that the Monarch was the strongest mage in the land, as all leaders had some form of magic. Wizards, sorcerers, bards, all manner of magi have held the crown and imparted some sort of needed stability to the land. Two years before your journey would begin, the 25th queen of Esra ascended the throne, was given her name, the one true queen, and Esra reeled. No one understood how a mere child could be the best among them. She had passed her first aptitude at the age of eight, uncommon but not unheard of in Esra. She graduated from the college one year later, rarer still, but also not unheard of. She chose to remain within the ranks of the college and spent four years studying under one of the best scryers in the empire. But even Elaine did not see what would become of her pupil. A pupil who had yet to teach a class. It was not within the realm of possibilities. And yet, it took less than an hour for the Divines to leave the side of Yurik the Provider as his 300-year reign ended. Mere blocks to meet a young woman tucked away in a secluded reading room hidden in the vast library of the college. And finally, to the naming ceremony where the Empire would see their new queen for the first time, luminous, nebulous, and unforeseen. For a while, the Empire is rocked with the knowledge that their fate is in the hands of someone so young. It feeds rumors in the darkest corners of the Empire, in the storerooms of taverns, in the smallest towns, and even in the heart of the brilliant city, Nikon. Are the Divines as infallible as you've been led to believe? This brings us to today. You have finally been deemed ready. You have graduated from the college and chosen your path in life. Each of you, for your own reasons, has chosen to join the Peacekeepers branch of the government that is in charge of patrolling, protecting, and fighting if need be. For the foreseeable future, you have all been chosen to reside within a village on the edge of Esra. So you guys graduated 
and you chose the Peacekeepers as your career path post-graduation. Days after your graduation ceremony, you receive notice that you are to deploy to a tiny village in the newly acquired region of Cornery. This comes as little surprise. New peacekeepers are often flung to the farthest reaches, where citizens may not be acclimating well to Empire rule. Most of the nations within the Empire came peacefully, seeking the resources and protection that Esra would provide, but Cornery was different. For some of you, the news of your post is refreshing. It means you can start work on something tangible. For others, you wish you had more time with loved ones, which you may or may not have seen in your time in the college just because of where you live. Um, and you only had a handful of days back home before you're basically getting shipped out again. Um, arrangements have been made to transport you all to the village of Asteneth. Um, in Essera, between major cities, travel is instantaneous. They have wizards on call basically opening and closing portals between known locations, sort of like instant warp gates. That's how, sort of how I'm going to describe that. Um, but your destination is somewhere that that infrastructure hasn't reached yet. So from the Sapphire City of Nassim, which is the capital to Amblish, which Taylor's character is from. So you more than likely are very aware of this capital city. Um, you guys are all going to be gathering there and then embarking in caravans with merchants and troubadours that are all going to be traveling along the Silver Road, which connects Amblish and Cornery. As you leave the main trade routes, though, all of those merchants and troubadours are going to fall away until your wagons are the only ones widening through this sort of pleasant arboreal forest landscape. It's pretty it's late summer, so the leaves haven't changed yet, but it's starting to get a little bit cool. At night, you guys camp warily because those merchants and troubadours told you stories of bandits and rebels, and that sort of hangs on you because uh, you're not too keen to be caught unawares while you're sleeping. It's been less than a year since Cornery joined Essera, so there, there's still a little bit of turmoil out here, and, and that makes you a little bit more wary than you would normally be out camping in Pleasant Woods. Um, despite being alone together for the first time, the fear that your conversation will invite any number of dangers into your camp sort of catches your words in your throats, so you don't really get to know each other very well, um, and, and you're going to be sort of hanging out in silence as night falls. It doesn't take long for a city to loom on the horizon, after you've set out, obviously. Upon entering it and greeting the peacekeepers stationed there, it is with great relief that you learn that Asteneth is only a hard day's ride from here. You're currently in Beluth, the siege-wracked capital of Cornery. Um, Taylor, can you make a knowledge local check for me? Absolutely. Ooh, <laughs> it's, uh, 26. It's 26, all right. So Let's go. You're, you're super knowledgeable about Beluth, which makes sense because you're from Amblish, and um, Amblish and Cornery are these two sort of countries that had lived codependently for a long time. They both created products that the other country wanted. Um, folks are from where you're from, call Beluth the Tinker City. Um, it's a home to all sorts of craftsmen and artists. Um, in fact, Cornery itself used to be ruled by a mercantile guild, um, and the people here were sort of raised to value craft and arts above everything else. Um, and as you guys are all traveling through the city, that becomes more and more apparent. There's all of these squares filled with beautiful sculptures and even the architecture and the buildings are more ornate than you're used to back home. Do you want to... I, I don't know if it would be a history check, because it's more like current events, like recent events. Do you, Would it still be a history check, Taylor, to know sort of what happened here? Um, I think that would fall under either history or local, so that's your discretion. I mean, you did have an over 20 role in your local. I'll say that you know, because... You're... I'm up to date. I've I've been here a couple times when I was younger, and I'm fairly involved in the activities of the nation. So yeah, because you you did say that your parents were craftsmen, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they would have probably wanted to be around these people. 
Um, mm -hmm. Carpentry, and since I'm very interested in just the arts in general, this was always an exciting place. Mm -hmm. Um. So, those of you that are all you're all traveling through here, you 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 notice that a lot of these buildings are sort of marked by war. Um, a lot of them have burnt down. There's like remnants of magical explosions, um, and you, even through that, you can still see the beauty that the city had. Um, so in in the time period between Ambalish joining the Empire and Coronary joining the Empire, because Ambalish joined first, um, the country that Taylor's family is from, and it was about a 20-year difference in time periods. So again, these countries were codependent, so imagine what happens when one half of a codependent couple is suddenly not there anymore. Um, and the reason that Cornery didn't join at the same time as Ambush was that the leaders, the mercantile guild leaders here, didn't trust the Empire, um, because the Empire has much more focus on um, more practical sort of traits than it would the arts and stuff. You wouldn't take a test and be questioned on how well you can sculpt something. It's more how smart you are, how apt you are to do things. Um, and slowly, Cornery fell into shambles. Um, that's people started to starve, and nobody was available to buy these ornate goods and very expensive objects that they created. Um, and there was actually a civil war, so you know that like this wasn't the Empire doing. Like The Empire didn't come in here and blow this place up. It, it was Cornery's own people fighting against each other. Yeah, because that was completely unrelated. It, it's just, like, that's a thing that you would know. Like, some people might assume things if they weren't aware. Walking mm. around here, do we see people? Like, are people moving around here? Civilians? Yeah, Um. so there's citizens sort of working and knocking down condemned structures and building new structures in their wake. Um, you do sort of notice that the structures that are being built here are very plain and sort of spartan like necessities of like we need to have buildings again and we don't have the time to create these beautiful structures um and they're all of this is sort of being observed by uh fellow peacekeepers who are there just to make sure that things don't get unruly again right yep um mm -hmm. actually hiro since you're looking around do you want to do a a check for me a perception sure. check I got a 16. Okay. Um, as you're sort of like wandering about, you're, you're traveling slowly through the city because it's a nice place to be. And there's lots of things to see that's sort of nice. And it's, it's like a calm and this sort of anxiety you guys have felt traveling through the woods on your own. Um, painted on the side of one of these new sort of like boxy buildings is um, beauty is always raised in the name of profit, in the name of power, in the name of Esra which reminds you in sort of a chilly way of the oath that you took just several days before at your graduation, which was, we shall stand in the name of progress, in the name of peace, in the name of Esra. So that's, that's odd, interesting. Um, and you, you guys have like a, a good amount of time in the city, it's morning, um, and you were told that it's, it's about a hard day's ride, so if you want to like get going and like get to your home, I, I welcome it. You guys can hang out here if you would like. Um, so I guess it's just sort of up to you whether you guys want to spend more time here in the city, which is sort of rebuilding itself or not. So what time is it currently? You said it was sunset? No, it's morning right now. So like, oh, it's morning. yeah, you guys woke up it, maybe like late morning, like 10, 11 ish in the morning, almost noon. You slept in. No, good no, no, here. you didn't sleep in. You've just traveled a bit to get to the city first. Got you. Um, well, I for one would like to uh, maybe not see the sights, but definitely the the historic um, bits of the city. Um, that's what I want to do right now. Does anybody else have any ideas? I mean, you are you are actually, together. Actually, actually guys. One's a mm -hmm. tour. Because uh, I got a 26 of knowledge. I think I can actually <laughs> give you a tour. I support a tour. Ray would love a tour. 
Oh, I mean, my. like, yeah, we could do a tour. Can we just, like, definitely leave right after that? Yeah, and since I don't actually know where anything is, <laughs> just what they are, I think we should probably do, like, a quick tour, get some food, and then we, then we can head out, right? Next. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say that, like, you're traveling around, Taylor. You're you're showing them to some of the the more famous squares where these cool sculptures are at, and maybe like some memorable like murals on the side of buildings. And every time you come across something that's sort of been damaged in this war, it makes you a little bit sad because you're like, no, 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 guys, really, it was it was really cool before. I promise. Yeah, this is getting me down. I think this is a good place to end the tour. <laughs> Okay, everyone, yeah, let's let's have some food and get on our way, right? Yeah. 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 I'll just say it disappointedly and <laughs> and walk with the group. Alright. Um, oh. what's what's around for food? Um there's a couple of like small local restaurants that serve like pretty like comfort foody type stuff, like like diners, basically. Like you would go in for like a shepherd's pie or um, a burger. Like not, I mean, fantasy burger, but <laughs> places like that. You know, oh. considering we've been eating trail rations, I think that's fine with me. <laughs> Y'all want some fantasy burger? I could use some meat. Is that the is that the brand name? Fantasy burger? Is this the chain? Yep, it's a chain. It it's, goes all across the land. Fantasy burger. It's I love around. fantasy burgers. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay, you 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 enjoy some choice fantasy burgers. Um, what 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 toppings do you want on your burgers, guys? Is that the is that the role playing we're doing? Yeah. What toppings? <laughs> You decided on this. I want to know. I, I think we need to put that back in your court. <laughs> what do you put on a burger? What is a standard fantasy burger menu? Yeah. Tell me about fantasy <laughs> burger. Cashier. <laughs> Cashier. Cashier. Are there exotic meats? Sure. We're just barraging the cashier. <laughs> this this very affluent chain that all of you have definitely been to before. You guys are like, wait, wait, but like, what meats can I have? Is there a veggie burger? Can I get can I get lamb? <laughs> I want fried pickles and goat cheese on my burger. That's awesome. I'm into it. Yes, goat cheese, wow. no pickles. Okay. You can all have goat cheese if you want. I. It's definitely available. That's mm -hmm. what I've decided. Or he wants goat cheese and whatever variation of bacon they have. Okay. Some some good bacon. Pigs exist in this world. You can get bacon. So do goats. It's not unheard of. Um, and again, this is like a city that's like dedicated to crafts and stuff. So like they would definitely have all sorts of meat, craft, burger toppings here, if nothing else. Like when you go to Japan, they're gonna have a sakura flavor of everything. When you come here, they're gonna have burgers with quail's eggs and mm -hmm. pineapple wow. I'm, I'm gonna try their riced cauliflower there you go <laughs> very very burger riced cauliflower <laughs> you, you make it into a patty okay so... get, get some like nice mustard on there there you go okay listen if you have like such low hb you probably don't eat that well so like <laughs> spend a lot of time in the stacks okay <laughs> I'll have a double <laughs> venison burger. Okay, okay. Alright, so you chow down. It, it's all pretty good. Oh, wait. But... I also asked for a toy with my meal. Oh. They, they give you a, a ball and cup. Smart enough. Ball and cup. <laughs> ball and cup. This is garbage. <laughs> I play catch with my sling while eating my burger. <laughs> you have the ball and cup, but you just sort of like put it on the table and take out a sling like mine's real mm. this is none of this fake stuff um okay so you guys eat your burgers it's it's like lunchtime now and um you, you sort of hit the trail again in the direction that one of the peacekeepers sort of le leads you on that's going to be um to a steneth um Woohoo, a Stenith! Yeah, you're traveling along that road for a short while. It's it's rather pleasant open space along some like wild grass fields. Um the road gets a little bit rougher the farther away from the city you get. It 
it slowly turns into like two wagon wheel tracks through woods that's sort of slightly overgrown. Um, you get the feeling that people don't travel between the city and Asteneth very much, if at all. The air cools as you near your new home, and the sun hangs low in the sky. As soon as you enter the town proper, um, you guys sort of start to relax a little bit because there's buildings again and you don't need to worry so much about bandits, hopefully, but it's odd because there is nobody here. Um, you were instructed in the notices that you were given when you were told to, where to go uh, to meet with the Empire's administrator, which is the college track person who's going to be here. Um, they're going to be called an administrator, and they're the ones in the, all of the towns that administer the tests that you guys have to take. Very apt name, yes? Uh, the problem was that when they told you to meet with this person, they didn't tell you where they would be. Um, and you can't find anybody here. It's almost like it's it's like a deserted town. Uh, do you guys want to roll some perception checks for me? Yes. Sure. Uh, well, I got a 26. I got a 21. You guys are very seeing things-y. Um, uh, I'm sure, you know, I can like, see around. <laughs> As you wander through the town, sort of looking for any signs of life, uh, you notice that there are some sort of flashes of light around one corner, and the closer you get, you see that there's sort of like a dim light emanating out of a rather pretty inn with the sign, the banded flagon, over the door. The exterior of this building is painted a cheery white, and all of the little details in the craftsmanship of this building have been highlighted in like a pale blue like a periwinkle color oh um, it's adorable yeah it's very pleasant but uh i will say that the color has worn thin and is peeling in places like it, it really needs a new coat of paint but it still looks cheery like it's not like creepy the paint's peeling it's just like in need of a little bit more love yeah the reason that you couldn't see the light you uh surmise is because there are these like long sort of showering vines hanging off of the eaves and the rafters that have these pale pink flowers um and they're blowing slightly in the breeze and every time they move a little bit just so you can sort of see the hearth light shining through um but when it's calm it's completely obscured from you guys oh wait how far have we gone from like the siege damage so that's the other thing is that you guys have wandered through this whole town and it seems completely untouched by war. Like, there's no fire marks. There's there's no, nothing that would indicate that, that people came here and were fighting. Hmm. Um, as you pull in front of the banded flag in and sort of get down and start to unhitch your horses, um, a woman in comfortable clothes rushes out with a bright grin on her face. And she has, like, like a, an infant strapped to her with like one of those um like big cloths that sort of like hold it in like a sling against her mm. um back she, she she's super happy to see you and she's oh my, oh my gosh you guys finally came here they told me that you might be here and i've i've been ke keeping open a little bit later than i normally would and i ke keep food on the fire i've had to throw out like five days worth of food but i i didn't want you guys to get here and not have anything oh my gosh i'm so excited <laughs> Hey. Well, hello. Hi. Uh, oh, oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Um, my name's Jess. I are you the innkeeper? Yes, I run the banded flag in with my husband. Uh, but you'll see me mostly. Uh, he stays inside and watches my boys for the most part. Okay, so you're the innkeeper. Yeah, that that would be my career path. Yeah. Good to know. Thank you. Um, as she's sort of introducing herself and talking with you guys. Uh. Like, slightly past a middle-aged looking man comes out of the inn. He's got, like, hair that was brown but is mostly gray now. There's still some brown in it. Um, and he's wearing sort of, like, these silver half-moon spectacles. Um, and he, he, like, pats her on the shoulder and says, Oh, Jess, uh, I'm gonna head out. It's getting pretty late. Oh, our peacekeepers arrived. Um, do you guys need any help, you know getting your horses into the stables it's not really a good idea to leave them out at night um here le let me help you guys and um do any of you guys want to like do you want to split up and have some of you putting the horses away or do you guys want to go in and get a, like a hearty meal 
after riding this whole afternoon. Why isn't it safe to leave the horses out? Uh, Jess sort of laughs a little bit nervously, and um, she's, she says, uh, I don't want to scare you guys off right away. It's not really, like, first time meeting talk. It, we live in these woods, and sometimes things come into the town, so we try to keep any sort of living creature inside. Oh. Um, oh. Well... <laughs> It's at this point that you notice that, like, both Jess and this gentleman um, have sort of, like, dark circles under their eyes, and they look, like, a little wan, like, a little bit ill um, or tired, like, overtired, and not, Mm -hmm. like, unhappily tired or, like, about to faint, but, like, just just less healthy than you're used to seeing. Yeah, this seems like an important conversation, but let's take care of it. And we, I, I don't want to trouble you. Um, so, you know, you, you have, maybe, why don't we just point you, you point us in the direction of the stable and we'll come meet you inside? The man goes, oh, no, 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 I'm heading that way anyway. I, I live on the outskirts of town. I, I have to be heading home. I was just helping Jess. Uh, she had a, a leaky roof and, uh, yeah, well, uh, Gregor isn't the the best handyman around. He's he's much better with the kids than he is with a hammer. Let's just say that. Um, okay. So right, yeah, that's like a weird way to talk about your husband in front of your husband. Uh, it, that was the 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 dude and not Jess. Like the dude. Oh, was gotcha. The and and the dude isn't Jess's husband. Um, oh. He's he's a handyman. Yeah. He he's oh. he's basically a neighbor helping out. Ah. Huh. Um. Here's here's what I'm gonna do. So um, Ryan's not here today. Um, let's say that Ryan's character volunteers to help uh, this guy bring the horses, and you only have three horses. It's it's not gonna need all of you to do it. Um, oh, okay. Um, you were mostly traveling in this sort of like caravan style thing, where like the horses were pulling, like two horses were pulling one bigger wagon, and there was like a smaller wagon with one um, that are all sort of regulation wagons that you were given. Okay. And the rest of you sort of shuffle into the inn, and she, like, just runs over to get bowls of this, like, really delicious-smelling chili that she's made for you guys. Um, And you've been traveling on the road together for a couple of days, but you haven't really had sort of, like, the peace and and the comfort to, like, get to know each other very well. Um, But you're sitting at this very, like, well-crafted oak table with this delicious chili set in front of you. Um, and you can sort of get to know each other for the first time because you are co-workers and you're going to be working together for at least the next two years. Oh, good. We're introducing our characters. You are. <laughs> I was wondering when, if we were going to do that because we were kind of part of the character creation. You know, I don't think we've told each other our names <laughs> ever or halfway. It's been a while, but this hasn't like formally happened. I mean, Taylor, you said that you you know Hyro's character. Yeah, that's what right. I was yes, I totally so, forgot. Shark. So I I'd be sitting next to you, uh, and I'd nod with you and go, "Hey, everybody, I'm Shark." I I do also. Um, this doesn't need to be verbalized, but just you know, emotions. I do appreciate that you don't think you're too cool to sit next to your old RA. Why is that weird? You know, because normally students think they're, like, too cool to hang out and associate with the RA. Because I'm, like, uh, I mean, not currently, but I used to be, like, the authority figure. Presumably called you out for smoking on campus or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, you're still a huge nerd, so you don't intimidate me. Uh, but <laughs> I'm glad we're friends. <laughs> You have, like, a lot of preconceptions about this, uh, this kid who used to live down the hall from you. <laughs> but not out there. Like, there's um, no guarantee that he was going to be like, this is weird. You just were, you just thought it was going to be weird. Yeah, I was just kind of throwing ideas at a dartboard to see um, what would connect with him. Um, so I guess he's the dartboard in that scenario, but... Wow, so now you're using him as a dartboard? <laughs> Yes, the secret here is uh, Josie is actually the delinquent of the party. <laughs> so we've met oh. we've we've met Shark and and Miss Josie. What do you guys look like? I guess. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, shark. Um, 
so I look mostly humanoid. Um, so I have slightly larger eyes, um, a fairly pale skin, blue hair, um, but my hands are webbed, um, and I'm pretty small kid. I'm like 12, 110 pounds, so I'm pretty short next to Josie, uh, but munching or... Are, are we eating right now? I, what yeah, are we there's doing? there's chili in front of me. So you didn't we just eat at Fantasy Burger? It's been half a day. So you had lunch at Fantasy Burger, and then you mm-hmm. traveled the trails, and now you've got a very nice hearty chili in front of you. Okay. Um, it's got some venison started... in there. It's just lots of beans, legumes. I just started absorbing it. Uh, <laughs> Is that so... a euphemism for eating, or do you literally just start like taking it through your skin? Uh, no, I just, like, literally lift the bowl up and, like, spoon it into my mouth. Okay, because I don't know the extent of the <laughs> anamorph as your character description <laughs> so, is. So he, um, so it's less that he, it's just, like, ancestry. He's he's a kid from the slums that's mixed race and doesn't know what he is. Okay. Um, but he he's mostly humanoid, but has aquatic features, like larger eyes and webbed hands and feet okay is he embarrassed about that webbing like did people make fun of him like that i'm I'm assuming that's how he got his nickname like his street street name but um like yeah i mean it's uh he's like fairly confident about himself so he's just like whatever it's part of me it's good for a 12 year old brave brave he's he's pretty controlled for the most part he just gets emotional all right miss josie what do you look like Okay, uh, well, you don't need to call me Miss Josie. Um, my my name, uh, either, you know, it's Josephine, uh, Josephine Hawthorne. You can call me Josie, you can call me Joe, whatever's most comfortable for you guys. I like Hawthorne. Um, That's nice. Okay. Sure. Yeah, good. That's good. I like that. Um, I'm kind of a lot of, not quite contradictions. Um, I'm young. I'm in my mid-20s. Um, I'm rather tall. I'm five foot ten, but uh, quite slim uh, and pale, which you can probably just assume is because I spend all my time inside, hunched over books. Um, I have brown colored eyes, and have dyed my hair like a very wild bubblegum pink, and you can see a bit of black showing in at the roots. Right. Apart oh. from that, um, oh man! If we're next to each other, stuff. we just look like the neon goof squad. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're definitely a little odd <laughs> placed into a into a room. No wonder he liked you. You shared a a die job love thing. Yeah, but the the heterochromia and um the the height mixed with being very very slim also put me a little. Um, you know, uncomfortable in a space in a way that maybe um, I identify a bit with his own outsiderness. I guess I'll I'll talk about Ryan's character since he's not here. Um, Ryan's character still hasn't come in from outside, and it's gotten dark, so dress sort of goes. Oh, um, I hope that Braylon ha- told that told him to like lock himself in with the horses if it was actually taking this long. Hmm. I mean, they didn't stray too far. It's just around back, so there's really no reason why that anything else would be the case. Um, but Ryan's character is a Goran, so he's made of tree, basically. He's a plant person. He's, like, humanoid-shaped. Um, Ryan himself said that uh, he smells of peppermint, which is why he goes by the name Peppermint. Um, but he, he, among all of you was the most silent anyway. He didn't really talk much in the entire journey. Like, you guys shared sort of, like, passing comments about the weather. Small talk. But uh, Peppermint didn't really say anything. Um, He wasn't, like, angry or mean. Just sort of not needing to pipe in all the time. Um, But he's still outside and dress locks up the door, which makes you guys a little bit nervous. Um... But you don't worry too much because as you were traveling, every time that you guys camped outside, he would sort of wander off and stand in the woods rather than sleeping. Um, So maybe he just 
walked off into the woods to sleep. I mean, he is mostly tree. Hashtag just tree things. Hashtag just tree things. <laughs> um, who's next? So it's not really, like, super concerning, right? No. Okay. You're just, like, noting it. Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, noting he, it. he hasn't come back. Okay. Who's next? I am. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm quack. I'm about three feet tall. Mm -hmm. Um... <laughs> Uh, Jess goes around back and pulls out a booster seat that she has for her kids for you so that you can sit at the table with everybody else without, like, being at an odd level. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I have steel blue skin and dark blue hair. I have hex codes for them if you really want them. And I am wearing a very oversized coat. And I have big eyes like most gnomes. <laughs> okay. What about Ray, Becky? She's fallen and she can't get up. <laughs> she did Becky? just disconnect and reconnect but it's oh. possible she's having trouble over there okay no no becky i guess in this lull i will say i i am i have a waistcoat that's important for me to share <laughs> i believe you that sounds amazing yeah, that's fair because i don't wear armor it's just a waistcoat <laughs> and a nice shirt <laughs> Um, I guess it's apt that the rogue is the one that you guys don't quite know <laughs> what she looks like. <laughs> she is an enigma. <laughs> um, she did message me back when I asked, uh, and she says she doesn't know why she cut out. Um, so hopefully... <laughs> hopefully she can cut back in. She finds her way home. Um, I guess while we're waiting, I can talk about the inn. It's super homely and lovely, and, and like just sitting in here makes you feel sort of like warm and warm and happy it's like very homey like i don't know how to describe it like somebody's living room like there's like little mementos and like pieces of art from the kids sort of tacked onto the bar and you know like, like it, a bed and breakfast yeah it's know? it's super like small businessy very quaint i like it. she still has that baby on her shoulder and she's sort of like singing to it, wiping down the other tables and setting the chairs on top of it. Um, she comes back over and sort of w talks to you guys some small talk. And she's, oh, I, I of course have rooms made up for all of you um, upstairs because you don't have homes yet. And uh, I mean, the community has been working on them to build them, but like um, it takes a little while to build houses. And they only told us like a week ago that you guys were going to be coming out. Um, but we, we, wow. we're we trying to get it ready for you guys, like, as, as best as we could. Yeah, absolutely. Take your time. It's fine. We appreciate the effort. Um, and your hospitality. Yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Well said, Hawthorne. <laughs> Can I have more chili? Oh, yeah, of course. And she'll take your bowl and, like, run back over to the sort of big pot that she had and fills it again and brings it back over to you. So I do have one quick question. Uh, do you know where um, our the, the administrator, the town administrator is? We well, one, couldn't really find anyone except for you on our way in. Uh, which I guess might have been just a getting dark, but... Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. there's there's about uh, I don't know, like 80 people that live here? There's a fair number of people. Most of us are... Um, well, most of the town, I mean, not me, are, are farmers. They sort of live on the, on the outskirts of town, so that makes a little bit more sense. There's not a whole lot of people here in the center of town, but you're talking about, about Filry, right? The the guy that administers those tests. Um, yes. He has a, a little shop towards back towards the entrance of town. You probably passed it, actually, as you were coming this way, um, but he's probably gone to bed. He gets up at, like, ridiculous hours of the morning and... Uh, the only reason I know that is because uh, the baby wakes me up, obviously, and I'll see him outside in sort of like the early morning light collecting herbs. He'll probably... Is he a uh, herbalist in his uh, free time? Then? Oh, uh, no, he's an alchemist. Uh, he probably oh. uses them to make all sorts of things. Of course. It's lucky for us because we didn't really have any alchemical or sort of sourcical folks here in this town before uh he came here and obviously you guys now uh do any of you guys do cool magic stuff we're pretty low-key here i oh. extend my claws from my hand oh uh, uh I, I'm, I'm wow a shift here. they're natural and i retract them back in um well 
You could say I do a couple things, and uh, as I say that, I'm going to kind of bring my hands out to either side as a, kind of a, a gesture to say, you know, these, these sorts of things. And when I do that, uh, my lyre is going to appear in one hand. And I just kind of like <laughs> wiggle my hands a bit, just like, ta-da. <laughs> Press the digitation. Uh, summon instrument, it's a cantrip. <laughs> summon instrument. <laughs> Um, you know, I can also use prestidigitation to get, like, some, uh, little sparkles around it. The- the baby on her shoulder, like, does that little baby giggle? That's, like, the cutest thing that babies ever do ever. <laughs> oh. Um, oh. and- and actually, as, like, you do that, um, you hear from behind the pair, Oh, man, that's so cool! And, like, this, like, eight-year-old boy runs out and, like, runs straight over to you, Taylor, and it's like, whoa, can you, can you do, like, no. more neat stuff? Oh, hey, Becky. Sorry, guys. I have no idea what happened. We missed you. We're glad to have you back. <laughs> Important things were happening, and it cut out. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Um. Um, we can get back to me impressing children in a moment if we want to just give Becky a chance to introduce her character. Yeah, of course. So, what does, uh, Ray sort of do in this environment with all of these people, and what does she look like? She's Ray is about five foot five. Um, she's slender. Um, she has uh, long black hair and very, very pale blue eyes. Um, they're kind of striking and noticeable, even though she, in general, tries to kind of... She's friendly, but quiet. Like, she stays back. She won't necessarily be the first to talk, but she once she gets comfortable, she talks fairly easily with people. She's curious she always wants to like she'll when she gets comfortable she'll start asking questions especially if um the group is starting to learn something about um the area that they're in taylor impressed a child a small eight-year-old child ran out uh and was like oh my gosh can you do like more stuff like that it's a, a little boy he has sort of mousy brown hair like his mom um it's it's clearly cut by her so not the best haircut that you've ever seen and um, he's, mm -hmm. he's got sort of like a, a cute smattering of freckles and um, very earnest eyes and she sort of laughs and fluffs his hair as she moves along the table making sure that you guys are still doing okay and going back to her chores and stuff. Okay, uh, well, I will, um, well, first, let me say tomorrow I'll be happy to show you a shadow puppet show as those are some of my specialties. But for the immediate moment, let me first ask, do you have any allergies? Uh, he goes... Are you gonna spit milk at me? Are you allergic to milk? Yeah. Okay, well, that's okay. Um, so I'm gonna reach into a small front pouch on my backpack, pull out a slightly larger uh, pouch that would have fit in that, mm -hmm. like a little uh, sack, and uh, bring out a hard candy from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and just like with a flare of my wrist, uh, kind of flick it to him. And then I will do like a little... Um, liar or peggio or something some fancy noodling okay and i'm going to get a 24 um on that performance because i've all my whimsical roles are all 17 18s <laughs> and 19s in in a fight natural one i die i'm not in a fight <laughs> that's my trick <laughs> Um, so that's gonna be my little impression. I'm gonna like so you toss, launch him a candy. You, you toss uh, a candy yeah, at him. A bag that is too large to fit in the little pocket it was in. Mm. Give him a candy and do like a fancy little liar ditty. Wow, you're like Mary Poppins. Is this a cultural reference? I would understand. Yes, we'll just assume that uh, Peel Travers existed in this world. Then we can assume <laughs> I have doctored most of my image around Mary Poppins. <laughs> You also have a umbrella with like a bird cane face. I do actually have a parasol in my inventory, so yes. There you go. Um, he's super excited and and <laughs> just sort of laughs again and says, "Garrett, honey, um, why don't you let them rest? They've been traveling a long time. Go go back with your brothers and your dad and and get ready for bed. It's super late. You should have been in bed already, actually." And he goes, "Oh, mom." But, like, sort of shuffles back mm -hmm. into the okay. back room again. Okay, can I do one more quick thing before I cede the territory to actual other players? Okay. Um, I I'd like to get his attention as he's leaving, uh, hold a finger to my lips, and, like, 
pull half an umbrella out of a bag that's like obviously should not hold something as long as an umbrella <laughs> and then i'm gonna put the parasol back in <laughs> he's he's got like 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 the biggest goofiest dumb smile on his face and it like goes back to bed like super excited about all of this um this I'm is like the the, the, the coolest ever. shit that he has seen in his entire life um the last magic user that came in here made potions that's not great and fun um <laughs> so yeah um that was garrett garrett's sweet um well, please yeah do any of you other guys like have anything else that you guys want to talk about now that you're sort of here and getting sort of like relaxing time is there anything else that you want to talk about as far as your your job goes because this is also the first time that you're sort of seeing your town and learning things about it do you have any more questions for jess so are we likely to see the administrator tomorrow uh jess clears her throat and goes oh oh yeah of course um i think actually since your wagons are still out front eula is probably going to get here first she's our elder i guess our mayor um uh, she'll probably bring you over there. It's sort of her responsibility to make sure that you guys settle in well. Cool. When will we hear more about the uh, animals in the woods? Because I'm trying to sleep safe. Oh, they they don't come inside. You're fine. As long as you're, you know, in a building before nightfall. What happens if you're not? Um, we've lost a couple sheep. Um, maybe some horses. Uh, it's not... Mm. I, I know it's it's hard on the is community. A, is it a moon dog? What is a moon is it, dog? Is it a dog? Like a wolf? Uh, no, we aren't quite sure what it is actually. Um, I'm not really the one to to talk to about it. Um, Eula oh. tomorrow can probably tell you some more things since it's kind of become her responsibility to deal with it. Okay, I thought you were privy to the news in Keep. Thanks. I mean, I know that it's happening, and I know how to keep my family safe. I don't really want to oh. know about all the the grisly details. Some livestock got killed. That's really all I needed to know. Thanks. Shark. By moon dog? Did you mean werewolf? No, I just like dog. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to check. Yeah, this is like some of the village type shit. I feel like this might be related to why we're here. Well, yes, this is a village. <laughs> but, like, okay, so you get Mary Poppins, but not that cultural reference? No. What? It's the village. <laughs> sorry, it's, it's, the a, village. it's we're an in a village. It's an M. Night Shyamalan movie. I know, sorry, I'm making a. I was being in character for that one. Um, <laughs> wow. There aren't movies in, in fantasy worlds, so M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah, and yet there's Marathon. And like, yeah, there's Mary Poppins. It's a series. There's like four of them. I read them as a child. They are lovely. If you did not read them, please go read them. They are lovely. Quack oh, is yeah. gonna go to bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else is still talking. You just sort of like hop down out of your booster seat and just wander up the stairs to any random room. Yeah, Quack oh. doesn't like being disagreed with. <laughs> and, is no... <laughs> and now is honestly has a very low intelligence score and is kind of confused. So Quack's gonna go to sleep. Yeah. Michaela, does this mean I would have a copy of Mary Poppins? Do you want a copy of Mary Poppins? Sure. Considering the lore we have just built, I think I would have a copy. Yeah, you have uh, one of the old copies that's like a solid red color with like white sort of crafterly illustrations on it of like her and like a, I guess it's sort of like a Baroque pattern. Not as fancy as that, but like the idea of that uh, no, cloth this mound. No, I can read it too quick sometimes. <laughs> not not a child but okay well, quick like grumpily walks up the stairs <laughs> like wanders the only away the child we've met knows mary poppins <laughs> just because he's taller than me actually um sort of not next to the bar but sort of in the back towards the hearth um near some tables there's a bookshelf with a lot of like classic children's literature in it oh what is Ray would the, what is the nature of book publishing in this world? There are books. They are cloth bound. They're actually probably rather expensive items, but um, knowing sort of how cornery works, there's probably a lot of publishers around. So it might be cheaper here than it was wherever you were. Taylor, probably your town and 
mm-hmm. country actually probably also had access to this fairly regularly. It does sort of make sense that your character would understand these references more than others. But there are like printing presses then, or is it a magical thing? Let's say magic. Magic okay. duplicating of things. Cool, cool. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Uh, do the rest of you guys want to head up to bed now? Is there any other sort of questions you have? I mean, it's after dark. It's late summer, so it's probably like 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Have we confirmed that the horses are safe? Yeah, uh, I mean, you assume so you don't hear them anymore. Ryan's character hasn't come back and just locked the door probably like half an hour ago, so he wouldn't have been able to get in. Could you just quickly remind me of the administrator's name? Uh, Phil Ree. Fillery. Not fillery. It's not that weird place no. from the the magicians. It's not the magicians, but I'm just going to make up. I'm going to assume it's a PH fill. Uh F I L R I fillery. No, it's a PH. <laughs> it's a PH. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> my poor my poor Phil. My poor Phil. <laughs> uh, and just like that, the world is remade. <laughs> The bedrooms are all upstairs. They're sort of single bedrooms. Um, you, you get the feeling that these haven't been used very often. The decor here is rather out of date. Um, but she has like five or six bedrooms up here, which sort of surprises you guys. Because, again, the road here was not very well traveled. Um, and from all that you've heard, it's just a small little hamlet to the north of the empire um i guess the other thing of note that you would have noticed as you guys were coming into town but i didn't like feel was necessary to mention is that this community is sort of nestled right at the base of a mountain range called the Saberwing mountains so um its shadow is sort of looming over the town um for a fair amount of the day um so it's possible that at some point people would be coming here to traverse those mountains. Um, Taylor, with I'm still using your knowledge local from earlier. Um, the Saberwing Mountains have an astronomically large uh, dwarven conclave inside of it, um, but it has been abandoned for centuries. So you know that sort of adventurers would want to go hmm. into this um, mountain range, into this enclave, and sort of search for treasures. Do I know offhand why it was abandoned? No. You just know that, because that's, like, way before your time. Um, Do I consider it mysterious, or just it's a thing that happened? I mean, I don't know. Does your character care about a dwarven enclave that for over a hundred years has been abandoned? And... My character cares about mysteries <laughs> and good stories. <laughs> Um, perhaps you've always sort of kept it in the back of your mind, so that would be an interesting place to check out someday. <laughs> Did they mine too deep? <laughs> maybe. Uh, who knows? That's that's just a thing. So you sort of get the idea here that, like, maybe people would stop here either on their way into the mountains or out of the mountains, um, but it's not, like, a common place that people come to a lot. Okay, cool. So while the rest of the group went into the inn with Jess, the, I guess, barkeep and person in charge of the inn, uh, you went around back with a gentleman named Braylon. Okay, so he, again, he's helping you with the horses. We decided that you guys have three horses, and he's just going to help you, like, board them in the back. Right behind the inn, inn? Right behind the inn is a int. Behind the int modifier. Uh, oh no, I was thinking more like a giant tree person. Oh, an ant! <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hey, my bro! <laughs> Me too, but smaller. Um, <laughs> uh, there's there's a, a little sort of stable with uh, space for several horses to be boarded for the evening. The thing that uh, both Jess and Braylon sort of let you guys know is that there's a curfew in this town. Everybody has to be inside, locked up um, by dark, the, like by nightfall, um, including any live animals. That it's not really safe to be outside. Do you have any questions for him while he's sort of helping you, or? 
Would he have any idea of who we have to meet? What would Braylon know? I mean, he know. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, that's that's Philry. He's he's sort of. I guess that's what he is—the administrator, right? He's the guy that does those tests that we all have to take now, huh? Um, yeah. He uh, he's probably all locked up by now. Most folks don't stay out this late, and honestly, I wouldn't have either if Jess hadn't needed the help. Uh, good neighbors and all that, so I, I rushed on over to help her with a little pl- uh, roofing issue. It's supposed to rain tonight. He's got a, a rather young mare that, that he's sort of hitching together and, and getting ready to head home because the sun is setting and, and he's got a little bit of a ride. Um, he clears his throat. Uh, I'm sure that you'll have time tomorrow to meet with Phil Ree. Uh, if he doesn't come straight down to the inn to meet you, um, Eula, the mayor, the town elder, might uh, stop by and give you guys, uh, I guess, a tour of the area. He, like, helps you get the horses in, he gets his own horse, and he seems sort of in a hurry to be on his way. Um, you get just because, you know, it's getting dark and he wants to be home, and it's yeah. d- dangerous to be out. He doesn't want to stick around gossiping. As you go around front to get back into the inn, though, the uh, the door is locked. Oh. Okay. Uh, um... So your options here are sort of limited. You can, you can, you can, I guess, try and shout. But from what you can tell, uh, like they're being a little bit noisy and rowdy inside, um, and they haven't really been able to hear you. Um, there's also like a, I'm gonna say, alluring woods that is behind by the stables where you just were. Um, uh. I guess that's the word I would use. There's an alluring woods. Or you could, I guess, go back into the stables if you wanted to. Well, there... you already said it's alluring, so I mean, it's pretty <laughs> tantalizing in itself. <laughs> um, it would be especially tantalizing for you. So these woods, the locals call them the fey wilds, um, because all manner of fairy creatures uh, tend to be here. There's a high number of them in quantity in these woods. Um and y- y- your race is sort of related to Fey, correct? If not Fey itself? Uh, no, they're more tree. The, the part of this woods that sort of is alluring to you, I would say, is um, there's like this, this like thrum of magic that, that is sort of permeating it. And as you step into these woods, you feel a little bit stronger and like more aware and the deeper that you step into them the the stronger that feeling gets like like there's just this like natural energy that is sort of like all around you that you could like tap into somehow as you are you know just sort of are are you wandering or are are is there like a particular direction into these woods you want to go, or are you just like enjoying well, your out, time? So I think you'd be enjoyingly wandering. Yeah, he's just like, ah, eh, whatever. Did Goran sleep? Do you even really need to be in the inn? Uh, it doesn't really specify, so I don't believe I do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for resetting my abilities and health, I feel that rest would maybe be required, but. Mm. It could be like the elf thing where you just need to like, com- like meditate or whatever or some other what well, i guess a plant version you need to photosynthesize <laughs> that is an ability but it doesn't specify that i have it but yeah maybe it, it's not super important um okay so uh, like you're 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 sort of aimlessly wandering through here just sort of like enjoying the plants and nature uh there's a lot of very useful plants here like, a lot of the shrubs and plants and trees all have medicinal purposes, magical purposes, arcane energies, and there's a lot of them everywhere. Um, and you sort of get the feeling that, like, closer to the inn, where you first set in, there it was, like, sort of almost cultivated into a garden, but not organized as such. It was more or less just people sort of picking the plants that they liked and relocating them there. Um, 
the farther in you get, the more obscure those references are. Um, but they are all medicinal magical plants that are helpful, um, or I guess harmful. They could be poisonous, uh, depending. It's after about like 10 or 15 minutes of walking that you come across the remains of a cobblestone road. And it it's really weird that this is here because the trees around you would suggest that this forest has been here for hundreds of years. Um, but there's this cobblestones, like, the roots have clearly broken them apart and they're not well maintained. There are shrubs coming out through the middle of them. But there is a road here. Um, do you want to follow it or do you want to go somewhere else? Yeah, the road seems it's weird. It, it's, it is weird. Um, as you uh, follow this road, it is not a yellow brick road, unfortunately. Um, just regular sort of gray cobblestones. I wish I was as interesting as... It's dark out. Yeah. It's, 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 everything's black and white. It's dark. It could be yellow stones. You don't know. Um, no, it's, it's not. They're just regular stones. <laughs> um, you hear voices. Let, let's go with that. Do you want to give a perception check? Sure. 22. 22. Wait. I'm sorry, 27. Oh, even, <laughs> even better. So with a 27, you are aware of the very turning of the world. No, I'm, um... <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you suddenly are like, I... Uh, sit down. <laughs> I'm a little bit dizzy here. Um, there's two figures up ahead. One of them is um, a woman, and she is one of one of the most beautiful humans that you have ever seen. Huh. Um, I could say that objectively, or I don't know how your character would sort of feel about human women. Um, but um, she's one of the most beautiful that you've ever seen. She's wearing this dress that is um, a blue so dark that it's almost black, but every time she moves, it's almost as if um, I have you ever seen those like snake skin where like you turn it just a certain yeah. way and it changes color? So as she moves, it almost looks like it's like gold and silver and bronze. But at, if she's standing still, it looks blue. So it's like a very sort of unnerving thing, and and it has this magical aura about it. Um, and she's standing there with uh, another young woman who's far, I guess, just plainer. She isn't unattractive, but but standing next to this woman, you get the feeling that like outshined. yeah, she's just like way outshined, um, and she's dressed more um, practically. You get the feeling like she's wearing, I guess, plate mail would be what it is, and and they're talking to each other. What do you want to do? They're talking. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I'd listen at first. Okay. Um, they're standing in front of what you notice to be the edge of a mountain. Um, and this is not surprising. As you rode into the town, you got the feeling that it was sort of nestled right into the edge of one of the Saberwing Mountains, which is a mountain range that travels along the northern uh, edge of the empire. In front of them, sort of recessed into the stone of this mountain rise, which goes up several hundred feet above your heads, is a very large stone door. Um, and the two women are standing in front of it, talking to each other, and the plainer one says to the beautiful one, I I cannot stress how important it is that we get what is in there, but I do not think going in there alone is wise. And the beautiful woman says, who do we get to help us? Do you want to just go and get a local guide? Uh, I feel like the more people who know about what we're doing here, the more likely it is that something gets out of hand. And the woman in the plate mail goes, I cannot protect you on my own. And the woman in the dress sort of seems very frustrated at this. Um, she's not particularly powerful looking in your eyes. And the woman in plate mail looks able-bodied, but together they don't form an intimidating team. 
Um, so they don't look intimidating. Okay. No. Um, or at least not like they're definitely not. They don't look like seasoned warriors, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. Do you want to keep listening to them as they chat, or? Uh, a little bit longer. Okay. I don't know if I should help or ignore. Okay. The beautiful one says to the other one, "This is gonna get annoying for me because I have to keep describing them." <laughs> <I know. laughs> this is fine. Um, the beautiful one says to the other one. Um, this might be moot because I can't seem to figure out how to open this door anyway. And the woman in the, the plate mail goes, uh, people used to get in all the time. It's not, it shouldn't be this difficult. And the woman with the beautiful woman says, <laughs> it's not this difficult. Then by all means you try. And she sort of like turns and crosses her arms um, do you, she's facing you now. Are you, like, actively uh, trying to hide yourself, or were you just... Um, acting tree-ish. <laughs> do you want to do a stealth check, or do you want to make yourself known? 24. Wow. She doesn't see you, but she is looking straight at you, and she has a grumpy look on her face. Do I notice how to get in? Uh, you'd have to get closer, I think. Um, the plain-looking woman is sort of running her hands along the edges of this the stone door looking for like any sort of like give or like handholds to like grab it and swing it open and th you get the idea even just looking at it that brute force is not the way to get in so that's not really good and you also get the idea that the woman in the blue dress is a magic user so magic clearly didn't help them get in either does it look like there'd be any other entrance um not nearby there may be other ways to get into the mountain um, throughout it, but... Uh, the easiest entrance is to pretend like they're not there and just walk to the door. Like, completely casually. As in, like, your character's gonna pretend that there aren't people there, even though there are clearly people there? Oh, like, pretend I wasn't listening at all and just go to a door. Oh. Like, pretending I just followed this path and saw this door. So you're acknowledging them, but not... No. Oh. They'll probably acknowledge my existence after I just walk <laughs> <Yeah. out. laughs> Um, The beautiful woman actually, like, yelps and sort of, like, takes a couple of steps closer to the woman with, in armor, and, and the woman in armor walks forward and pulls a short sword from her hip and, like, points it at you, being like, What manner of fey creature is this? Who are you and what do you want? I want to know where this opens to. I am a tree. They're not really sure how to respond to you, as yep. you as you just said. I am a tree, and <laughs> I'm still looking at the door. Okay. Um. Can you do a knowledge dungeoneering check for me? Sure. Nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. Um. There's a series of uh sections in the door carved into the wood that appear to be dials that you can turn that would edit the pictures or like the way that the carvings would be to line them up to make pictures um and you you see you figure that that is the way to open the door do you have like a i do have detect magic and arcane okay are they cantrips i don't want you to like yes. waste okay do you want to do that <laughs> uh sure there's a spell of a, a warding spell on this door that uh seems to be very old and very powerful. Um, and when sort of your detect magic spell hits it, aside from clearly coming back to you as, yes, this is magic, it, you also get the feeling that your spell, the closer it got to the door, the weaker your spell got, and it sort of dissipated as it hit that door, um, which you think would, would any uh, charms like, like knock or like any other spells that would open the door through magical means would not work here. Um, and it's also, I guess with your knowledge of engineering, it's very thick. It's very heavy. So unless you were like superhumanly strong, there's no way to just sort of like rip this door from its, its uh, track here. So I assume I have to turn these knobs to make a picture. Mm-hmm. I guess make another engineering check. 21. Okay. Um, as you twist these dials, uh, 
you notice that like all of the images on the dial would line up in some way with the image on top to create something slightly different um, and whether it's your own sort of natural instinct or something else you manage on the second try to get the correct sequence and as the last dial sort of clicks into place there's like a, a thrum of magic again similar to what you felt when you first walked into this forest but like much closer and far stronger and the door recedes into the space about three inches and then rolls to the left into the mountain wall uh, leaving an opening and the continuation of this road um, into the maw of this large space in the mountain. Um, the, the two women behind you who had been sort of watching you do this and like bickering back and forth about what to do, you know, one of them being like, like he's not attacking us. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to hurt him. <laughs> he, he must be some sort of fake creature. This there's no other explanation. Like, what creature, what manner of creature is made of tree like this, other than some form of dryad or, I don't know, tree like magics? Maybe he's a forest golem? And the other one goes, there's no such thing as a forest golem. The magic one's going. No, no such thing as a forest golem. Um, there's an earth elemental, I guess. Um, but that would be made of rock. I don't know what you're going for here, friend. And the other woman sort of like glares at her. Um, and the beautiful woman looks at you and says, Tree man? <laughs> like, very confused. I thank you for opening this door for us. What? I must ask again. What, what are you doing here? I got locked out. You, you got locked out of what? Out of out of a building? Yep. So you're supposed to be in a stenith right now. Uh, sure, yeah. She she looks you over once and and says again. I I thank you. I think it would be wise not to hang about out here in the woods. And she looks at her friend and her friend goes, I don't know that we should take him in there with us. I don't trust him. And the other one says, I mean, he opened the door, and maybe he can help us. And they're, they're sort of bickering again about what to do with you. I just walk in. 